talk about, you know, interesting parts that I think they might cover. I have something that might help you. I don't know if y'all have done this before. But if you go to YouTube and you go to Bozeman Biology, if you type in Bozeman Biology, have y'all, has anyone here ever done this? Bozeman Biology, this is, uh, this is just made by a teacher, kind of like me, who did his own things, and uh, it's, it's done really well. They actually spent some money doing this. Um, but I'll type in plant structure, because that's what chapter 24 is on that we're doing today. Oh, we're skipping 23? We're skipping 23. 23 is not covered on the test, so I'm not doing it. So... Plant structure, I type in Bozeman Biology plant structure, and you see this plant structure, 13 minutes. He does 13 minutes, just a general view of the basic things you need to know about plant structure. <coughs> or maybe not, it's just a spinning circle. Oh, do the arrow keys, you can play, press the arrow keys. <laughs> yeah. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about plant <coughs> structure. So a good way to think about this is plant anatomy. If you've never stood next to a giant sequoia, then you should. Uh, it dwarfs all the trees around it and shows you how huge plants can become. So he goes on and on here for 13 minutes. It's not that long. You, you could watch it, you know, you could watch it in, in a short amount of time. And he hits the major things you need to know about plant structure. And uh, I think that's, that's good. Um, uh, you know, it might be daunt a daunting task for you to read this entire chapter. You don't need the entire chapter. You just need highlights. And he gives some good highlights. What's it called? Um, it's called Bozeman Biology. So you would suggest re like watching this and taking notes and reading the chapter? Uh, probably so, if you if you don't have the time to spend. Or you would learn more if you read the chapter. Okay, but does this but mean when you test us, you're going to give us... Well, I'm testing you with questions that they offer from AP exams. If you noticed, uh, it was kind of more like that on the last test. Be, uh, and I'm not going to be specific for things from our book. Now, there might be something in our book that he doesn't cover that is on the test, but that's possible. I can't guarantee it. And, and I'll talk here in class. I'll use the... Uh, I'll use the... Um, book here to do my little lecture series. Yeah! And I know it says chapter 25. This is from last year's. Uh, I haven't had a chance to plug in the new pictures, but it's basically the same as chapter 24 in this year's book. So but anyway, he hits, I, I, I watched that show, and he hits most of the things that I'm going to talk about here, so it, that might be helpful for you to, to watch. I would go along during the, when I'm talking here, and maybe note the pages that I discussed, so you can study them if you want to do that. Um, basically, plants have three parts to them, three major organs, <coughs> the roots, the stems, and the leaves. And the roots anchor in the dirt, <coughs> and they absorb nutrients. This is 24, page 444. Now, the root, when you say they absorb nutrients, the plants don't get any energy from what they pull out of the soil. They can't, it provides no ATP for them. What they pull out of the soil are minerals that help their, their metabolism work, that help their enzymes and such. Potassium, nitrogen, um, magnesium. <coughs> These are things that plants need from the soil. Calcium. And they pull it up and it helps them, their cells work. It doesn't help them get any energy. Their energy is obtained in the leaves through the process called, do you remember? 
Photosynthesis. Nailed it. Photosynthesis is where they make their food. And then the food is in a form of a sugar, a carbohydrate, that they transport through these leaf veins back to the stem and the roots where it's stored. They store their food in the stem and in the roots. And often will kill the plant, pull the root up, and eat it like a carrot. Like a carrot, excuse me. And that's, you grow the plant, it stores its food in its root, and then you kill the plant, then you eat the carrot. That's what farming is all about. Or a potato. Or a potato, which is stored food. Or a corn cob, which is stored food. So we take advantage of these plants in, in our everyday life. And a lot of what you eat is plant material. So we call the part above the ground the shoot, and we call the part below the ground the root, and it's a basic rule of thumb that the shoot system and the root system are about the same size. Think about that with one of those giant pine trees out there. The shoot system and the root system are about the same size. Now, the roots are usually more spread out, whereas the shoot is more tall. But if you mash the two of them, they'd be about the same. You crack sidewalks and things, right? Right, yeah. Grow up, cut through a sidewalk. Primary growth is growth upward. Secondary growth is growth outward. And plants do both. They grow upward and outward, which I'll talk about more in a minute. This just shows pictures of plants growing. Yeah. The little lines that you see there, those are veins, leaf veins, leaves, all leaves, roots, stems, they have little tubes running through them. The tubes are called xylem and phloem. Xylem tubes carry water And phloem tubes carry uh, sugars and other nutrients. So they have two kinds of veins running, and they're usually kind of together, running together. There's a xylem and a phloem and, uh, tube that are kind of running. Are there the stems? Tubes in the leaves? The tubes in the leaf, yeah. Those little lines that you see are xylem and phloem tubes. That's what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. And these veins are not just in the leaves? They're not only in the leaves. They run down the whole plant. Have you ever cut a piece of celery? Mm -hmm. And you see the little dots inside the celery? Those are xylem and phloem tubes. Or the stuff is in your teeth when you eat it. That's yeah, those yeah. long strands. Yeah, yeah those, are, those are long fibers that surround the, the uh, tubes. There's actually two sets, two, two major groups of flowering plants. There's monocots, and there's what we call eudicots. And when we say cots, we're talking about the cotyledon, which is uh, the little seed leaf. Inside the seed of a plant, this is a corn plant, which is a monocot, and inside the seed, there's a little leaf there. And we call it a cotyledon, or seed leaf. And uh, monocots have a single cotyledon, and eudicots have two cotyledons. Is it possible for them to have more than two? Nope. Flowering plants are either monocot or eudicot. <coughs> so it probably is. It's just a leaf. Is a, is a leaf inside the seed of a plant. So what is a flowering plant? A flowering plant produces flowers for reproduction. Flowering <coughs> stuff. Yeah, like a pine tree is not a flowering plant. A pine tree is, is a gymnosperm, which um, produces cones, doesn't have any flowers. So flowering plants actually produce flowers at some time. Most of the plants you see out there are flowering plants. But there are also ferns are not flowering plants. What are seed leaves? It's a leaf inside the seed. What is that? What does it mean? It's just something that's in there. It's used for storing food inside a, a, a seed, and it's called a cotyledon, a seed leaf. Um, 
Um, gra all grasses are flowering plants. Uh, uh, um, magnolia tree. Can you give an example? Has a flower on it. Um, an apple tree. <coughs> Any uh, Spanish, moss. Spanish moss is a flowering plant. It's not. Your Can you give us an example plants. of a not non-flowering plant? Pine, Pine tree, tree uses a cone. That's what he was just saying. Gymnosperms. Gymnosperms are non-flowering plants. Ferns are non-flowering plants. So are non -flowering plants. Mosses, the little low-growing green plants that okay. look like green fuzz on a rock, those are not flowering plants. But most of the plants that are out there are flowering plants. Are those angiosperms as well? They're called angiosperms. That's another name for flowering, flowering plants. plants. Angiosperms. Mm -hmm. angiosperms. Okay. And you can see the two groups look differently. If you cut a monocot at its stem, you'll see the xylem and phloem are arranged in a ring. These are both types of flowering plants. See the flowers over here? If you cut a monocot at its stem, you'll see the xylem and phloem are arranged in a ring. I'm sorry, this is not in the stem. This is in the root. See, there, there's a root there. If you cut a unicot at the root, you'll see the xylem and phloem is arranged in a star pattern. So. Do we need to know all the differences? Not really. And parallel leaf veins are in monocots, and netted leaf veins are in unicots. So they're just the, they're just two different they're different types of, of plants. I want you to notice these right here. The red toward the inside is where the xylem is, and toward the outside, the blue that's where the phloem is. Xylem always tends to be more toward the middle, and phloem tends to be more toward the outside. The bark of a tree is mo as much of that as phloem. In the inside of the tree, the wood of the tree, much of that is xylem. So the water kind of moves up <coughs> toward the middle of the tree, and the sugar, the sap, kind of moves on the outside of the tree. Is that like the rings of a tree, and you cut one down. And well, we'll talk about rings in just a second. Look at here's a corn seedling sprouting a root, and look, it's got all these root hairs. You know why it has root hairs on it? It's like mold. It's not mold. It's actually part of the plant. Is it like embryo? Or something? It's like what? Well, it has a purpose. More surface like area. Like embryo or something? Does it like more change? surface area? Is that, was that you, Jonathan? What is this? Do it, partner. <laughs> more surface area. The, the hairs here cause there to be a lot more surface area for absorption. Remember when we were talking about surface area? That's why your towel, your, your bath towel is kind of hairy and not just flat. Kind of hairy. It, it has more surface area to absorb water, you see. Hey, there's a stomach. Hi. <laughs> I'm sideways, stomach. The little thing in a leaf that lets in carbon dioxide and water comes out. That's what you're doing in the transpiration lab right now. No way. It's because of these. Now, usually the stomates are on the underside of the leaves. And that's because the sun is usually hitting the top. You don't want to put your stomates on the top because when the stomates open to let carbon dioxide in, if they're on the top, a lot more water will evaporate. So they're on the bottom, so not as much water evaporates. You don't want them in direct sunlight, you see. Plant cells are divided into three categories. They have a funny name. Parenchyma, calenchyma, sclerenchyma. They're shown in your book on the top of page 449. Parenchyma, calenchyma, sclerenchyma. Yep. What page is that on? 449. Put a star by it. 
Page 449 for the start by us. Top of 449. Parenchyma, colenchyma, sclerenchyma. Normal plant cells are called parenchyma cells. They're just normal cells. But some plant cells have thicker cell walls. They're tougher. Colenchyma cells have thicker walls, you see. Look at the difference between these two pictures. Parenchyma, colenchyma. The cell wall around the cells is thicker in colenchyma. Those cells are, colenchyma cells are, are fortified cells. They help make up tough parts of plants. Like the core of an apple, have you ever noticed it's kind of tough? You don't want to bite into the core of the apple, that's kind of, it's kind of hard because it's made of colenchyma cells. The little fibers in a celery stalk that get in your teeth, those long fibers, they're tougher cells, they have colenchyma. And the toughest plant cells of all are called sclerenchyma cells. Look at these cells. Their cell walls are so thick that you can't, light won't even pass through them under a microscope. This is what makes uh, the toughest part of a plant like a nut, the, the covering of a nut. What about like bark? Bark. I don't know if bark is made of sclerenchyma. I'm not, I'm not sure. So they're non-living? It says they're non-living. Non-living, yeah. The cells die once the uh, cell wall gets that thick. So, so they're dead stuff cells? Can't, yeah, they're dead cells that are there to, that just protect just things. For the surface growing skill, or are they all? These are only kind of plant cells? These are, uh, these are the three types of plant cells. Parenchyma are normal cells. Colenchyma are tougher cell walls. Sclerenchyma is the toughest of all. And they're dead. Mm -hmm. They're so tough that their okay. cells are dead. So like outside of the night is dead, and then the inside is like this. Is the inside parenchyma? These are living cells. For, For a nut? nut? The outside is sclerenchyma, and the inside is parenchyma? I don't know. I think so. So we don't care? I don't know the answer to that question. This is showing you an up close of what xylem cells look like. Xylem cells are tubes that water can go through. Here's a xylem cell, and, you, and here's a, it's attached to another one right above it. And water can just go up through the plant from the roots to the leaves through these tubes, you see. Sometimes the xylem cells are thinner like these over here. Sometimes they're wide. And these cells in between just kind of separate the xylem. But I want to talk about, show you about the xylem because the xylem helps form the rings of a tree, which I want to get to next. I think I have rings up here somewhere. There's a lot of pictures in this chapter. Aha. Have you ever noticed that a tree has rings? You cut it down? How old is it? it? Tells you how old it is. But why is that? How, why does it form rings? Well, the rings are the xylem cells. The xylem cells are put down by a special layer called the cambium layer. And this, this layer of cells here is called the cambium layer. It's a constantly multiplying, it's cells that multiply very quickly to produce new xylem cells. Now I want y'all to look up here. I know some of y'all aren't looking for whatever reason. Check this out. As the plant grows, these cells multiply and produce these xylem cells on the inside of the tree. The xylem cells are produced toward the middle of the tree and phloem cells are produced on the opposite side. So there's phloem produced over here and xylem produced over here. Now check out how this works. As xylem cells are produced, they are different sizes. The cells are real big and wide if the cells are produced when there's a lot of water around. 
So here you see in the spring is when it rains a lot. The spring wood has these big, see the big white cells? You see how they're kind of white colored? In the summer, the cells are a lot smaller because there's less rain, and in the winter, there's almost no cell, new cells put down. What page is this on? 456. 456. So this is why there are rings on a tree. In the spring, wide cells are laid down, and those look white. And then when the rain slows in the summer, fall, and winter, smaller cells are put down, and those look dark when you're looking from afar. And then the next spring comes around, and there's a lot of rain, so there's wider cells again. And then fall and winter gets dark again. So it goes light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. And you got every year you got a ring. That's why there are rings on trees. Does that make sense? Now the cells toward the interior tend to die as the years go by. So these cells all end up dead. And the only functioning cells are toward the outside. So af after many years, there will be all these rings. All these are dead cells, and only the ring toward the outside is the one that's actually transporting water up the plant. Yes, question? So it, it just keeps all that dead stuff? It keeps all the dead stuff here. Now the bark will fall off, so the phloem falls off each year. So the phloem doesn't form lines. Only the xylem forms the rings of a tree. Uh, it's just some, uh, what it's called pith. It's the name of some storage cells that are in the very middle. Can you use that for like wood though? Yeah, this is all wood. If you cut a tree down, this, this all forms wood. So the inside of the tree doesn't do anything? That's right. All it's used is for support. What causes knots? Isn't that like cancer um, cells? I'm not sure. Tree cancer? I'm not sure. It's like when you're sawing or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow the, the wood has grown strange. So the phloem fall off each year and the xylem is what the inside is dead? Yep. It's true that trees can get like cancer cells though. Mm -hmm. There is a tree in my old house that has it. How long can the tree live? How long can the tree live? Here's the oldest tree. Six <laughs> This alternation of growing in summer and shutting down in winter leaves its mark in the tree's trunk, annual rings. The white wood are large open cells that were laid down in the summer, and the dark wood, small dense cells, laid down more slowly in autumn and winter. So by counting the rings, I can be absolutely certain that this beech tree lived for over 200 years before it fell and that's longer than any animal lives. The record for longevity, however, is much greater than that and is held elsewhere. feet up in the White Mountains of Eastern California grow the oldest living things on earth, the bristlecone pines. This part is already dead, but here there is life and growth. Those rings in the trunk tell us exactly how old these trees are. Because the conditions up here are so extreme and it gets so very cold in winter, some years there's very little growth at all. And as a consequence, the rings are very much more close together. This is a cross-section of one of these trees. The outermost ring is the year in which it died, 1958. Count 100 rings inwards, 1858. Another century, 1758. Around here is the ring it was developing when Columbus arrived on this continent in 1492. 
It was in the full vigor of its youth when the pharaohs were ruling Egypt. So we can be quite sure that when the first human farmers were just beginning to plant seeds for themselves, this ancient ravaged tree was just sprouting. It's over 4,000 years old. Huh. What's the oldest animal? Is it a turtle? I'm gonna yeah, the giant tortoises can live up to 200 years. Oh, is it? I am now. Oh, it could be. Oh, I actually killed it by accident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those redwood trees grow really tall. Hey, there's a there's a room inside a tree. Tree store. Isn't there like a road that goes to one of those? Yeah, there was, but that tree fell down. It used to have a road going through it. There's me by some redwoods. <laughs> Yeah, have you been to the Muir Woods in Africa? Yeah, I have. I went to Muir Woods over Thanksgiving. Yeah, I got some pictures. Cool. I'll, put, I'll put them up here. There's some. The last thing, uh, Redwood Forest in San Francisco. San Fran. The last thing um, I want to show you. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry about that. Um, is uh, the, the cross section of a leaf which they show to you on page 459. The AP test is interested in cellular stuff. And this shows this, all the different cells of a leaf. And you see, there's the little stomates. You see the stoma? And those are what let oxygen uh, uh, I'm sorry, let carbon dioxide in for photosynthesis. That's how these cells, these cells right here are called mesophyll cells. And these mesophyll cells, that's what do photosynthesis. And the carbon dioxide gets comes in through the stoma, stomata, and the water comes in through the xylem right here, which is the red tissue. And then the cells make their food, their sugars, and the sugars get transported out in the phloem, which is the blue tissue. So usually the phloem is carrying sugars down a tree toward the roots to be stored. The and usually the xylem is carrying water up from the roots toward the uh, stem. So it's kind of, these roads kind of go in opposite directions. Somebody ask a question there? What is, what is they're called mesophyll cells. See that word right there? So we need to know about like the different kinds of mesophyll? There's two kinds. There's palisade mesophyll, which is these type up top, and there's spongy mesophyll, it's these type on bottom. They both do photosynthesis. I don't know if they would ask you that. That's pretty specific. So the phloem carries the sugar out of the leaf? That's right. Because all these cells are making sugar, you got to do something with it. Now, there's a waxy layer on the top and bottom of a leaf called the cuticle. That's an important layer, because the cuticle is a wax that keeps the, the leaf from losing water. Water cannot penetrate the cuticle layer, and neither can air. It's a very tight covering. You've noticed that we, leaves are, are waxy? That's this cuticle layer. And so the only way air can get in and out is through these stomates. The stomates will open to let the carbon dioxide in, but when they do that, water is lost. That's the transpiration that we're studying in the lab right now in the experiment. Yes? Um, then what's the point of the epidermis? If there's uh, the epidermal layer is just a covering layer that's more protection. Sometimes you just need cells to take up space to provide structure. What are the trichomes? The trichomes are little hairs. Often leaves have hairs to keep insects off and things like that. So uh, do your best, kind of look over that chapter. If you can read the whole thing, great. If you want to look at that video that that guy makes, that's a good, that's a good review of what I just said. Bozeman Biology.